Welcome to the Catbird Quilts. I'm Kathy Martin. Today I'm going to show you how to quilt an orange peel quilting pattern with a walking foot and I have a lot to say about it. So stay with me. So I recently quilted the GeoGems baby quilt with an orange peel quilting pattern. And because I'm from the South, I'm gonna say peel <laughs> or some weird way, I don't know, I don't say peel properly. If you're not familiar, the orange peel design is actually, the piecing is on the design wall behind me. Um, but there's also the quilting that's the same, the <laughs> same pattern, just not piecing, just the quilting part. So that's what we're gonna do today. And I wanted to start by showing you uh, the actual example and let you know a few missteps that I made that we will not be making in this how-to today. So the first was I thought that I could kind of eyeball it um, and wing it a little bit and not mark it. And when I first got started, I was anxious about it. And quilting like this typically does not go well. And that is in fact what happened. So it was, um, I'm, I'm gonna actually point out my mistakes to you. That's probably not a great way to start off the how-to, but I'm going to anyway. And it's more just so that you know kind of the pitfalls before you get started. So you can see here, some of my orange peels are not very smooth. This one had a little right there. This one, <laughs> same thing. There's one over here that's just, bless my heart. I just was not apparently in a smooth motion <laughs> right here. And you'll notice some of these are very wide. They're fluffy. Some of them are less fluffy. Um, and so you can tell the row that I started on. <laughs> it's kind of just bless its heart. As I was doing it more though, and then figured out, oh wait, I should just mark this and then just sew on the line. It got far better. And you can see that over here, still not perfect, which is not the goal anyway, but you can see these little peels right through here are far smoother and a little more uniform. This one in particular is pretty good. Um, so you can see it, I kind of straightened myself out in the end. And so I want to show you how I did this and some tips for having them look more like this and less like this. <laughs> so first, let me show you what we're going to practice on. So here's what we're going to practice on. And the first thing that you want to do when you get ready to do your orange peel is you want to look at your quilt pattern and figure out what size and curvature and all of that stuff that you want for your orange peels. But before you can do that, you want to think through how you want to mark your quilt. Now I will tell you, this is nice and pristine because I use spray adhesive for my quilt sandwich. I typically pin based because life is not hard enough and I like to make it as hard as possible, especially while doing my hobby. Uh, so normally pin based and it's just how I learned and so it's what I do. But because it's a smaller piece and because I knew I was gonna be doing that curve through my sewing machine, I opted to spray base. I feel certain you can still pin base, I just not have not done that. So I suspect it would be a little bit harder because you're having to navigate turns and pins. So just know that if you pin baste instead of spray basting or glue basting, um, that may pose some challenges. While we're here, let me tell you that my focus for doing this particular practice piece was putting together dark fabrics that would show up when we do the quilting. My piecing leaves some things to be desired. And so some things came together beautifully, other things not so much. So if you think to yourself, gosh, 
those points didn't come together at all. No, they did not. These are shirts, largely. The navy is a shirt, blue is a shirt, yellow is a shirt, and then this is scrap fabric, remnant fabric that I've had for a long, long time. So just so you know, if you're like, will this work with shirts? Yes, it will, because that's what's right here. So as for marking tools, I have an array that I wanna show you. And there, as many as I have, there are probably that many more. This is a hair marker. When we got this, on the outside it says bone folder. <laughs> it does not fold bones. It's supposed to be made from bone, but it's actually not. It's resin. All it is is a blunt <laughs> object that will not crack that's got not a sharp edge, but just it comes to a point. And you can score your quilt and it presses an indentation into the quilt top and then you just follow the quilting on the line of the indentation. You can see where I just did that. So I'm pressing down pretty hard. Now, this works beautifully. The wonderful thing about it is it does not leave a mark, literally, well, it leaves an indentation, but it, it isn't something that has to wash out. It'll just, you know, shake out. Um, the downside for me, and maybe you're not like me, but I've been this way my whole life. I have a hard time staying on a creased line. Just like, you know, when you're in elementary school and they say fold your paper and then cut on the fold. The, where I cut on the fold looks like I've been blindfolded. I don't know if I just can't see the line, if it's the, sh I don't know. I mean, and I even turn the paper over and like hang the fold on the, sh but cannot hold a straight line with a fold. And I have found that to be true with a hair marker too. I'll score it and be like, perfect. And then I put it under my machine. I'm like, where is that line? It's, it really, it's kind of ridiculous. But that's a wonderful option if you don't want to have to worry about it leaving, you know, chalk residue or whatever. Next option, this is a chalk pencil, which is what I'm gonna be using today. This one is white, I also have yellow and blue. These are available everywhere, even in big box stores. So you can get that and it does exactly what you would expect, which is it just make, you just make a mark and it leaves it. I have this Taylor's chalk, which I adore and I think largely because it looks like a guitar pick to me. And since I'm married to a guitarist, I don't know. It's just really appealing. Same same idea there. It just makes a mark. And these come in dark colors. So for example, if you did not want to use white, if you have a light quilt, I will tell you from experience that if you use a chalk pencil or colored chalk, so a chalk pencil that's blue or yellow, um, sometimes if you press too hard or if it's just a fabric that takes the chalk really well, it won't come out in the first wash. So you either have to pre-treat along your seam line, uh, your quilting line, or just know that you may have to, you know, wash your quilt again or spot treat it or whatever. I use a toothbrush and some, I said that funny, tooth brush. Uh, I use a toothbrush and OxyClean. Um, but, you know, if you don't want to have to work that hard to clean the marks out that you put on your quilt, then you might not go the chalk route uh, or just, just know that in advance. So that's another option. I will tell you also from experience that if you have a light background, and you really would like to have something that has a point on it, um, a great way to go is just a graphite pencil. It comes out in the wash. You don't have to pre-treat it, even if you press down. And I've done that, but I also did a test before we did this video. I have a, I wear a white lab coat to work. And so I turn the lapel over and I like with this graphite pencil and then just put it in the wash just like we do normally. And when I pulled it out, you can't even tell it was there. So if you have a light colored quilt and you don't wanna worry with chalk, but you know you need something dark and you're not a bone folder, like I'm not, um, just a, a little graphite pencil, even a number two pencil will work. This is a um, 6B. 
Progresso 6B. So that's how soft it is, but not that that matters. But if you were wondering, uh, so that's a really great option. If you don't have a hair marker and you want to go that route, if you don't have specialty equipment, I mean, this is just a butter knife. Obviously, don't use the part that's serrated. Just use the curved so it's sharp because it's flat, but it's not sharp like it won't cut through your fabric. And then this is just a plastic knife and it will do exactly the same thing. So you can even see the mark that that just left. Same here. So if you think you wanna go this route and you don't wanna have to purchase this, just, I mean, you can use a better knife. So anyway, food for thought. Also, not specialty equipment, but if you have some kind of kitchen towel cloth, this is a bamboo paper towels, reusable paper towels that we accidentally soaked the whole roll <laughs> under our sink and we put it in the washing machine and it came out perfectly fine. It's a wonderful thing to have so that if you have a you know, a oopsie in your mark. You can just dust it off, especially if you're using a chalk marker. If you use a graphite pencil, obviously this isn't gonna do the trick, but just don't worry about it. It'll come in the wash and just put it, put the mark where you want it. All right, so you might have noticed I've added some more <laughs> specialty equipment. When I was trying to figure out what to do with the GeoGems, I knew that I wanted to do something curved because it's very angular uh, pieced pattern. And I felt like I wanted something that kind of was curved throughout, but free motion quilting and me, we are not currently friends. I'm really trying to force that friendship, but it's just, it's not going well. And so what I decided that I wanted to do was I wanted that curved line basically to go through this piece and then into this piece and so on and so forth. So let me show you that. Uh, actually, I'm just gonna mark, mark that. Each one of these pieces is the same size. So I knew that whatever I did to this piece, I could do to this piece. So you see that I'm just eyeballing that. And that's kind of how I started. And I just like, oh, okay, well that, and I got about that far and went, oh, that'll work. And then kind of started quilting, <laughs> which is why that yellow piece in the GeoGems looks so wacky. So what I would advise to you instead is look at your pieced pattern and figure out where you want your orange peels to go because it's gonna, that decision is gonna impact what sort of other specialty equipment you use. So I wanna show you some different ways. This is just a little, I mean, I literally rated my whole pantry, um, my dish cabinet. This bowl is almost exactly the width of that piece. And so this would be a very, very, very <laughs> fluffy, we won't call it fat, fluffy sort of orange peel. And I wanna show you what that would look like. So I'm, right now I'm just kind of eyeballing it, but you get, get the idea here. And I obviously did not line that up exactly right because it should not come together that way, but that's okay. So this, if that makes sense, when you do this, this sort of piecing, really you're just doing a whole circle. And it's like a for real live circle. It's not, it's not a narrow orange peel. Um, let's see, how do I wanna do that? So you get a sense of what that would look like if we quilted it that way. That is pretty cool looking, but it's a very, severe circle. So the curve, it's a very cur high curve, um, which means that when you're doing your quilting through your walking foot, it's you're not going on a straight line at all. It's just you're constantly turning. That's a lot of work. I think it would be a beautiful pattern, but it's, it's gonna be a lot of work to actually do that with a walking foot. So that's, that's one example.
All right, next I'm gonna go one size up and we'll do that over here. And what I'm gonna do is connect, so I'm going from this corner to this corner. And because I'm only using a part of that circular plate, it's gonna be a much narrower, more like an oval, less like a circle. Can you see that? So here it is again. I'm just start. I'm I'm making that plate cross right where those corners are, and you can see that is still curved, much more narrow orange peel. I hope you can see that, but still, you know, works perfectly well but you're not gonna lay the plate down and do the entire circle of it. You'll have to do each one as it crosses whatever mark, arbitrary mark that you decide. So do you see that? And that's what that will look like, which I actually really like that. And that's pretty close to the shape of the ones that I did in the GeoGems quilt, and so it comes together. It is definitely an oval, but it's not quite as round, and it comes together that way. And then if you wanted even more narrow, you can take an even bigger plate and do, again, same concept, and it's gonna be, so you just take a, a, whatever bigger circle you have. And see how much more narrow that is. So I'm doing exactly the same thing. I'm just wherever it's crossing at that corner is where I'm tracing that down. Let me see, we're gonna see that through. And each one has their place. They just, it just each has a different look. And I find this much easier. I did, when I did that first one, once I realized that I needed to mark it, I, um, I did mark it, but I kind of eyeballed it. And apparently my eyeballs are not to be trusted because there was not a lot of uniformity there. And this just, for me, gives me a sense of like, okay, they are, they're not gonna be perfect, but they are gonna be at least somewhat uniform. So you see, see the difference here? Here is the narrow, here is a little bit wider, and then that's even more. So you just really kind of decide. Another option that you can do is you don't use anything circular and you just decide like how, how much of a curve you want and you mark that distance so you don't actually even draw, for example, the circle. You just put a little mark all along and then when you go from the corner, you just direct your walking foot to there and then back again. And I will tell you when I started this process, I, you know, it would have been smart for me to watch YouTube and watch some tutorials. There aren't a lot, but I didn't watch any. I just kind of got in there and did it. <laughs> but you can just, you know, like, okay, I want to I want my curvature to be two inches from the edge and then just mark two inches and trust your gut. My gut isn't really trustworthy. So, um, so yeah. <laughs> so that's some ideas for you. I hope you can see um, how that's gonna go. I think I'm gonna go with the narrow for our example and you know, we'll see how that goes. So I've marked my quilt and I've got my sewing machine ready. I have put my stool up a little bit higher so that I'm not holding my shoulder up like this on my <laughs> table of my sewing machine. So I'm above looking down. And what I've done, I've put my walking foot on, I've changed my stitch length to a little bit bigger than my normal piecing. So I usually piece at two to two and a half. 
I've got it just shy of three and a half. I just like the way it looks better. I think it's a little bit more manageable. And what I'm going to do, I've already done one, but I'm going to do another. Just do a quick stitch to make sure that my tension is right um, and that I'm kind of ready to go so that my very first stitch is not on my quilt. It's on a little practice piece. So all this is is just a shirt, some batting, and another shirt. And I just am going to just do a little test run here. And so I'm going to just make a turn. I'm just turning for no other reason, just to get used to the feel of it. And you may notice I didn't pull or tug. I just kind of let it, I just held this still and let the machine do the work. I have my um, quilting glove on. I have another one that's this one that works well as well. You can do two gloves, you can do no gloves. Um, it's just whatever's comfortable for you. But having that little grippy part at least on this side, I think is useful. So let me just get to the rest of this. And I'm gonna go off here and you can see that actually my tension to begin with is a little bit better. I think I need to actually let my tension up just a little bit. When I did this as a practice, uh, I started on this side and just then it looks to me like it's just a little bit too tight on the top. Let me loosen it up and see. So yeah, that's a little bit better. This one just didn't have, really what you should see is each individual stitch on both top and bottom. It shouldn't look like a line like that. It should have little, the little indentations where each stitch is. So that's that looks like that's gonna be good for me. Now I'm using Aurafil Dove Gray because Melanie Ham told me so. <laughs> and she helped teach me how to quilt. So, but it has turned out to be a wonderful piece of advice. Just a light gray is a wonderful choice for thread um, because it's light enough to show, but not so light that it calls attention to it. So if you have any little oopses or bobbles or bumps, it's not a big deal. So let me get with the quilt and we'll get started. All right, so I have marked the quilt. I decided to go for kind of a narrow, um, little orange peel. And what I'm going to do is actually start off into my batting. And you don't have to do that. I just like to do that to have some extra thread in the event that my, my beginning is not great. And I can always pull that out or hide it in the binding. Now, if you want your orange peels to come to a point Short of your binding, you'll need to start your curve, you'll start your stitch there. So it will go like this instead. So a quarter of an inch in, because that's gonna be, this part right here is gonna be covered up by your binding. I don't really mind my quilting being off the edge. So I'm just gonna start on the edge. I'm gonna start off here in that angle. So, and I'm doing this, I'm kind of getting a sense of the direction that I'm going. You can see I'm gonna be following this line right along here. And so I'm getting the quilt kind of started in that direction. And now, now that I have that that way, I'm gonna roll this up just a little bit on this side and I'm gonna roll it up a lot on the other side. So you'll see me, my hand coming up. So now I've got this into a manageable little area. And I'm just literally gonna follow the line. 
Now, the great thing about quilting, just like, and this is why I started this out in showing you my mistakes, is if you miss it, it really doesn't matter. Now, the, the tail of my quilt is in my way as I'm going on the curve, so I'm just gonna roll this up just to get it out of the way so that I could keep managing it. All right, now I've come to my point, and you can see now I'm gonna go back the other way. So I'm basically just making a big, narrow S, and I'm just gonna follow this back around. And fortunately, in this case, I don't know why, but it's just kind of doing the work for me. And so I'm just kind of, I know it looks like I'm wadding it up, and it's because I'm wadding it up just to get it out of the way, to make it go through that curve of the neck. All right, and so every time you cross the mark, you're just gonna go back the other way. It literally is, is that simple. Now, you may notice that I'm, sometimes I'm right on the line, sometimes I'm not exactly on the line. And that is the beauty of the quilting part, is it does not have to be perfect at all. And what I don't do well with quilting, and so I feel like this is the pot calling the kettle black, but is just the, the far bigger issue is just to keep it smooth and continuous. So if you miss the line, it's not a big deal, but if you do realize you miss something, don't make any radical <laughs> changes because that's where you have those kind of wonky seams and stitches and This is the sort of quilting though that you do have to reset your position a lot, or at least it, it seems like it to me, or it does to me. So it's not one of those things where you roll it up and then run it through your walking foot and you're done. It's, it's a constant, like, let me stop and reposition and get this back where I want it to be and keep rolling. All right, so I've made it one whole, one whole length. And now, let me show you what that looks like. And you'll see right away that I got it right on the line in some places and like right there, beautifully done. Right here, not as much. <laughs> and it really doesn't matter. Now we're gonna start just exactly like you might imagine that we would back at the top, and you know you always wanna go all one direction. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have wanted to turn around and go back the opposite way because it will pull those layers of the quilt apart and there will be kind of puckers along the way. So this time I'm starting from the opposite way and I'm just gonna go through and do exactly the same thing just in the opposite direction. We're gonna do one more row, just as an example, so you can see how it comes together. Um, I will show you a trick that I have learned. When you have a quilt that you're gonna be turning and going different directions, I write on, in my batting, <laughs> the word top, or, you know, I'll go, like this is the way, I'll do an arrow, like this is the top of the quilt. And then now that I'm turning it, I'm gonna come over here and put, this is, put an arrow, this is the side that I need to start on. And I'll put left or side or just whatever word. That way, invariably, as I go back and forth, and especially when I'm weaving in and out like a, like this um, spiral, 
I'll lose my place and then I'll end up going the opposite direction and then it does that thing where it pulls the fabric funky. And so I don't really want that. So I'm gonna start on this side and I know anytime I'm going horizontal, I'm gonna start from this side. Anytime I'm going vertical, so top to bottom, I'll know to start at the top where I marked it. So let's do one more, actually maybe two more, and then we'll see how it's gonna come together. Now you can tell I don't really have a line there, so I'm just inferring where it needs to go. And now it's time for me to roll this up. It really is a lot of shifting. So this is the, you know, the upside is that I'm getting curves with my walking foot. The downside is it's kind of a constant negotiation. Okay, so looks pretty good. You can see where my horizontal row that I did has just come together with my vertical row. And you can infer how that will look once that's in every place. You can also just see from the drawing from my marking what that will look like. And so I'm gonna keep going, you guys. That's really all there is to it. It's, it's not all that deep. It's just not that hard. Okay, so I've done two sets of horizontal rows and two sets of vertical rows, and that's what I have in front of me. And you can kind of see how it's shaking out. So here's, here's like one full completed peel. Um, and it's just as, <laughs> it just is what it is. I wanted to point out right here, I had a little, this is, you know, I made this statement, you don't want to do any quick changes. Here's one of those little baubles. As I sit here and look at it, I'm like, oh man. And then like right here where it didn't come together, oh man. But the reality is once I get this finished and washed and bound, I will have to work really hard to find those places. And so basically it's just, you know, it's, it's just orange peel quilting with a walking foot is what it is. <laughs> so um, you can also just, I felt like I need to mention, if your piecing is not such where you can use that as your guide for where to do your circle peels, you can sew and or mark a grid and then do your peels around the grid. So for example, if I didn't actually have these, you know, piece seams right here, so there's the square, you can kind of see that. I could draw that as a grid and then my orange, and I could sew that to start with, and then my orange peels would have a seam up the center. So it would really look like a leaf um, in every direction. So you can do that, and that's a look. I mean, if you really wanted that level of quilting, you could do that as well. So just if you're approaching this like, well, that's well and good, but my piecing, I can't really go like this corner, this corner, that sort of thing. You could just draw and or sew a grid and then do your peels around your grid. So. Anyway, just a little tip there. I hope this has been helpful for you to maybe be courageous and try orange peel quilting with your walking foot or curves. Just maybe get out there and try. Um, if I can do it, you can do it. I promise you. I'm Kathy Martin. This is the Catbird Quilts. Thanks so much for watching. 